go? Yes. All right, so hello everyone. I think I've met uh, at least some of you guys yesterday. Uh, my name is Daniel Smith. I'm with Molsey. Uh, in, in theory, we are kind of a group that uh, really aims to help bring all the CMS together a little bit um, by either building tools or doing educational components for the like. Um, so I'm kind of here as sort of like a, an honorary open force field consortium member at the moment. Um, so everything that I say is just kind of like my own experiences. Um, and I think a lot of stuff that I'm going to talk about is, um, you know, not exactly for you exactly, um, but I hope uh, you can use them as ideas uh, to kind of tailor them, uh, these kind of thoughts and ideas for something that you guys really uh, need and want. All right, uh, so first of all, uh, I used to be a Site 4 developer, and I keep saying uh, all everyone using our MP2 and DFT. Um, so I, before I left uh, to go join Volsi, I rewrote all the DFT, um, so we have a whole suite of new acronyms to uh, add on to your functionals um, as you wish. Um, we also have a whole bunch of cool things like uh, time-dependent response, we get your C6 coefficients, which you talked about. Um, also, I think my favorite is you can use second order code champ conversions, or if you have unrestricted code champ, it spells out sucks. <laughs> um, either way, uh, it's pretty cool. Um, but I think the really big thing that you guys might be really interested in um, is that uh, there's a lot of uh, basically inefficiencies uh, in the DFT before. Um, those have all been removed, it's been uh, vectorized and threaded, um, and we're seeing uh, you know, about 12 x speed up on six cores for the V builds themselves which translates to an overall speed up between like, I know, two and 10-ish, uh, depending on your molecule size and system. And so one of the things that I think uh, Cycle has been focusing on a lot lately is uh, not really how big of a molecule can we do, because we can do um, you know, quite large molecules, but I think there's better programs and approaches um, for doing really, really big systems. Um, and so what we've been focusing on is what can I put in memory and how fast can we do that? Um, so if I have, you know, 15, 20 atoms and around DFT, uh, we basically want, we want to do that as fast as possible. We really want to reach peak on that. So it's something we've been optimizing for. Um, and kind of on that vein, uh, actually I had a student uh, working on the uh, JNK objects, if you're familiar with um, Hartree-Fock theory. Um, and so these are going to get another factor or two as well. Um, just kind of, they were actually originally speedups going for the Xeon Phi, but as we found, um, the Xeon Phi is pretty bad. Um, but all these optimizations that you do for Xeon Phi is actually really good for conventional Xeon or AMD processors as well. Um, so expect this to come out uh, fairly soon as well. Um, so all this together is going to make Psi uh, quite dramatically faster uh, for your everyday computation. Um, I knew people love MP2. Uh, that's getting a speed up too, but only really for large molecules. Um, yeah. So, Daniel, yeah. just, just on the side four thing there. Mm -hmm. So these these changes look really good. Mm -hmm. Now is that going to be in the content installable side four soon, or is there going to be like a version upgrade and then it goes on to Conda, or how are we going to get those? Yeah, so it's on the Conda dev channel right now. <coughs> side four dev, we pull that down. Um, basically, we need to figure out when we need to make the new release, and I think that needs to be very soon, like the next month or two. Um, so once that release is minted, these changes will be in side four that you can just pull down Conda installable. Okay. Um, but yeah, if you want the dev version, you get all these changes right now. Thank you. Um, so one thing I was asked to talk about is I have a, a large-scale quantum chemistry database project. Um, and uh, this is kind of the what I came up with of how do we do really large-scale quantum chemistry databases. Um, and, and so effectively what you have is uh, you have some sort of central server. Um, if you're familiar with... Uh, uh, CS lingo. This is like an MVC model of this kind of thing. Um, so you have a central server that kind of acts as your, your hub or your interface. Um, so for example, this is going to do everything from actually managing the database um, to handling the queue if I want to get it to a whole bunch of computations, or if I'm like a client and I want to get some data, like it's going to handle all of this together. <clears throat> and so I think this is becoming more and more common. Um, if you look kind of like at uh, Orion, like it's a very similar model in a lot of ways. Like you might have slightly different arrows, but um, overall this kind of thing I think is really kind of coming into focus. Um, and so what you do is, like what you really want is you want to have some clients. So this is going to be all of you. Like if you want to get some sort of data, um, you're going to see none of this, and you're just going to have like a little Python string that says like, go off, give me this gigantic data set. Um, so this, a lot of where um, a lot of your work is focusing on, I think, is going to be on the client side. Um, uh, so you also have a giant database on the back end, so it's going to actually hold all of your data. We'll talk about that. Um, and then also we have a bunch of dif distributed servers to actually go off and compute these things. 
Um, so in this kind of fashion, you kind of get around, um, you know, having to sit there and going like, oh, I'm a grad student, you know, I'm going to submit, uh, you know, these 20 jobs to this thing, and then run a partial script, um, and then submit, you know, another 30 jobs for this, and then another partial script, and kind of hand curate all this. Um, all this is kind of automated, but basically I say like, hey, um, I have this set of molecules, I want you to just go run it. Um, it goes off to your server, it automatically pushes to your database when it's done, and it can run on a variety of different things as well. Um, also, I, I put a video up on this to kind of give you more of an idea of like this in practice. Um, I will say that this kind of stack has really come along in a year when I made that video. Um, so all of my stuff I'd recommend like rewriting at this point, but I hope it, it gives you kind of an idea of what kind of like interactive computing can do. Um, yeah. And so one of the big things that you have to work on is, uh, so how does this communicate? So, you know, I have these computations and I run them out in the cloud. Um, and so how do I know what's in them? Um, and so one of the big answers to this in, in databases for a long time, especially in SQL databases, is you have these things called schema. Um, and so the problem is like schema means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, so I kind of want to go over like kind of a, like more of a quantum chemistry schema. Um, I, I like JSON, so if you want to stuff in JSON, if you want to do XML or message pack or anything, it's, it's all fine. Once you get it in one of these languages, you can translate between the two virtually seamlessly. Um, but schema, at the end of the day, is basically these key value pairs, um, where I have something like, you know, what is the title of this object? And it's going to be the person. Um, and then I have uh, various things, like first name and last name, what is their type? Um, so this is very important, but I can't shove arbitrary things into arbitrary fields. I have these set fields, um, these set values, which makes things so much easier on the back end. Um, the big thing is like you have validation tools, so you can check and make sure people are actually giving you valid data. Uh, if you don't have that valid data, things go already right pretty quick. Um, and so whenever you build these kinds of things, uh, you really want to consider your input output field. So this has uh, a lot of domain knowledge, figuring out exactly what you need to go into it and what you want back out of it. Um, but also, uh, you want to add flexibility to these things, um, because what's going to happen is uh, I'm going to have like this great schema, and then someone's going to be like, well, hey, well, why didn't you think of this thing? Um, and so you have to version these things and consider how to put them into optional fields and the like. Uh, so it gets a little complicated. Um, but there's a couple of big projects um, that really kind of help you with this sort of thing. So JSON schema.org is a big one. You can use JSON. Um, XML and SQL have these things kind of built in. So it depends on kind of what language you really want to go with. Um, so on this vein, uh, it was kind of a good idea for actually quantum chemistry to have one of these. Because uh, I think about quantum chemistry programs, I have a whole bunch of just like ASCII text input files. Um, they vary pretty widely across basically every single input program. Um, not to mention your output is just, again, basically a log file. And so to get, you know, a gradient out of that, you have to be like, hey, I need to look for the line called total gradients, and then I got to look for the dashes, and then figure out when the dashes stop, all that other stuff. Um, so if you actually have a schema, yeah. So with your schema here, and what your, so they're all just plain old data? Yeah, it's just pop. Yeah. Okay. What? Uh, it's only data. So, <laughs> so you can, I suppose you can use, so you can serialize, serialize anything else, and then put them yeah. in your schema. And, and and that's the biggest thing is like if I have a complicated object, I need to figure out a serialized version of that. Um, and so I'll talk about how we do it for molecules and quantum chemistry data a little bit. Um, but the the serializable aspect of this is huge because everything that we're going to do, well, everything I'm suggesting that you do is going to be on the internet on the cloud. So whenever I'm shipping data back and forth, I have to have this basically this binary format that I can pack and unpack on the other side. Um, the reason that I, I really like JSON and XML over um, basically ASCII text files is uh, all of these things are basically language agnostic. If I want to unpack them in Python or C++ or Java or Pony or Lisp or Erlang or anything like that, um, they all have JSON and XML parsers. Um, and so what this does is, like for example, like in Python, this is a list. And C++ is the standard vector strings. Um, you know, in something like Erlang, this is going to be an array of characters. Um, so it, it automatically is able to translate this to any language that you have, um, which is very, very powerful. Um, and again, it's everything serialized, so you can just kind of ship it across the internet, you can compress it easily, et cetera. Um, and most importantly, this kind of data, this kind of thing actually maps really well to SQL databases and NoSQL databases, where you can just shove it right into the table um, without really worrying about exactly how to put every single element in. Answer your question. Uh, well, almost, because uh, you're going to drive towards a spec. Yeah. And your spec is going to involve serialization. 
is the serialization, how you serialize and unserialize part of the spec. Yeah. Okay, now you've answered my question. Okay. Thank you. Oh, sure. <coughs> is your is your goal to put this in like have Sci4 be able to emit JSON at the end yeah. of its computation? So Sci4 can actually input and output JSON right now. Oh. Yeah. So um, what's really nice about this is I have this JSON object which is serialized. I know exactly what's in it. Um, and I can go ahead and just get this output, and then this output is all my values labeled by their keys, and you know if I want a gradient, it's just sitting there in an array. So if I want to import this into C++, I can just boot up something called rapid JSON, import it, and I get a standard vector of doubles, which is going to be my gradient C++ side. Um, so what this does is it kind of completely takes out this human element and all of this parsing that people do forever. And you have everything in these formats that are already programmed um, for these language-specific uh, components. So it maps it perfectly um, into individual uh, programs. <clears throat> so, uh, Mulsi is actually getting into this. Um, is one of the biggest things is I think is uh, the variety of inputs and outputs in quantum chemistry is really quite diverse. And on top of that, you know, a tiny little change can break your parser before you even know it. Um, so one of the ideas is like, what if we had actually a spec or a universal schema that everyone could use where you have an input and output um, that's kind of universally recognizable. Um, and so what's nice about this is if I have consumers and producers of this, um, every single consumer producer that I add that uses the spec, uh, everyone automatically gets this kind of transferability and this interoperability um, because we're going through this, uh, this generalized intermediate representation. Um, one thing I'll note is that uh, this is up on GitHub. Um, we've heard a lot from quantum chemists and visualizers and the like. Um, I think uh, some of the, the ideas are going a little far um, but I think uh, everyone here really should give some input to this because we haven't heard from this kind of community before. And so figuring out what can serve this community and kind of help you know, bring it back into something um, that everyone can use I think is very important. Uh, so if you have some time, um, this is on the multi GitHub repo, I highly suggest looking into it and exploring a little bit and giving your feedback. Um, Everything is going through GitHub, um, raise an issue, make a pull request, um, so your standard things to help out at the stack. Um, so we kind of hope to have something finalized in the next couple months. Um, so do kind of edit it now. So in terms of that, like, are you imagining it extending to cover non-quantum data, or are you just asking make sure that the quantum spec covers our quantum needs? Yeah. So I I don't think we can really get full MD. I think <coughs> yeah. that's that that's going to be a little bit crazy. Um, but I think what we can do is get at least enough information so that if I have some sort of molecule, um, I should be able to get it into an MD program without too much issue. Um, so I think this is going to be stuff like bonding information and charges and the like, and like a different respect than what the current charges are. Um, and so I, I think that's where you can get a lot of synergy if we can figure out this kind of um, you know, molecular topology stack that's kind of universal. Um, and also, right now, it has a couple different ways of specifying a molecule. Um, so for example, like the two is your basic quantum chemistry molecule, um, but also they really want materials as well. Um, so you can just basically switch between the two, and if we need a third representation, you know, I don't think that's going to be outside the scope of this. When you say specify molecules, you don't want to know the bond orders and stuff to possibly take care of that. So you need to do something different, I think. Well, I mean, I think when it comes to bond orders, the question is why not put that information in? Like, I mean, if, if, if I just do like a breadth of search, like on the quantum side, to do something, to give you some information, I think that, that might be good enough. So, in terms of finding the data, I guess. So, basically, so so energy yeah, so you're saying if we increase the situation, which I've seen in other file formats, like um, SP, SP, files, SP files, where you have the potential to have an internal inconsistency in your file because you submit it seems like two specifications. Like the, well, if, if somebody puts in, if you do a quantum calculation, it may be, the thing may be arranged in the act, it may not stay what you thought it was, but it's still tagged with that molecule. Sure, I mean, I'm not saying that it's you know, a bulletproof system. Uh -huh. you know, I'm saying at least think about it a little bit. Mm -hmm. You know, can we make small changes? Can we just do like a little bit and make it more useful for you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I agree if like, Changing the schema a bit meant that typically out of Psi 4 we get output that has you know bond orders in the molecule we can just directly read it and that would be awesome. But mm -hmm. that's really what you're saying. Yeah. 
Yeah, and so that's a good example, right? Because like right now, I think we we're mostly interacting with visualizers, and so we get you know property data and geometry data and vibrational data. Um, but you know, if we do uh, bond orders, we need some way of specifying that in the spec. And right. you know, I think you guys are the people to really help specify that. Yeah. 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 Definitely. I think a point is made is, I mean, it, it would be really simplified things if we could just go straight yeah. to these two. Yeah. And then, and that's the hope, right? And just make it vastly mm -hmm. simpler to get. So basically, use these things as engines rather than kind of like these standalone programs. Um, what do you think that having <coughs> multiple structures in a single file? So that's um, kind of a hotly debated topic. And um, I keep coming back to, I don't really know. So if I think about a quantum chemistry engine, um, one that's perhaps not as flexible as type 4, having like multiple structures in an input file is really hard for them to handle. Um, so if I think about games or something like that, you know, how do I really, you know, if I if I put this in the spec, how do I deal with that? It's basically um, multiple. I mean, you can do a game yeah. calculation on the binary, so you need something different. Than that. So Sorry, I I mean I, I mean like <coughs> if I had twenty confirmation with a small one. Um, yeah, so I, you know, I'm I'm kind of leaning towards no, because I think um, in that particular case, what you would do is like you could make like a wrapper that just simply calls a program twenty times. Um, as I said, it, it's a highly debated topic. If you have thoughts and inputs, I think you should make an issue and be like, you know, I think this should happen. Mm -hmm. um, so, so the suggestions you'd like us to make go in as issues on the issue wrapper. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or if you see like something obvious, just go ahead and make. Um, and so uh, this is a like the simplest example that you can have. Um, we're doing something called the big philosophy, where everything is going to be these large arrays. Um, so, for example, my geometry here, uh, those really should be floats, but it wasn't quite long enough. Um, where I, I basically specified helium, my geometry is x, y, z of atom one and two, just like in a single line. Um, you really want to do this for efficiency reasons, uh, because otherwise, if I'm building like a list of lists in Python, that's extremely, extremely costly. Um, and also, the serialization and compression of this kind of representation is a lot better. Um, and so we have uh, basically a helium dimer right here, and what I do is I say I want the energy of this. Um, I can't just do energy, I might want the gradient to Hessian or some sort of property. I can ask for any of these things. Um, and then I'm saying I want it to be SCF and STO 3 g level theory. Um, so you write this little spec, you drop it into Sun 4, um, and what you get back out is the first thing is the input exactly reproduced. Um, and then also you get a little bit of provenance information, so who actually created this. Um, going deep down in Providence is another interesting topic because you can, you know, do something pretty shallow or you can do something insanely deep. Um, finding that line is always hard. Um, but I think the big thing that you guys might be interested in, for example, is um, all the energies that are produced by the Cypho program are right here in the JSON. Um, so if I pull this in uh, to Python, just saying like JSON that loads in the line of code, I can say, I want the property dictionary and the SEO total energy, uh, and then I'm done. That's all you have to do to load these things in. There's no more parsing about the files or anything like that. Um, and this is going to be across the board for energies, gradients, you name it. Um, and so for things like vibrational frequencies and bond orders and the like, um, you know, we need to input on exactly how to do this. Um, there's also like a little bit more information, like if there's an error or if there's success, um, but also if you want the raw output, uh, we can also put this in here too. Um, I generally don't include the raw output because it gets so big so quick. Um, you know, like uh, 100 kilobytes times a few million molecules, and you really start talking about some data. Um, so, anyways, uh, please check that out. Um, I think this is kind of at the heart of a lot of this database tech is getting a good through the spec going. So, just just while we're going at the spec, see method, see basis. Yeah. Um, look, basis is lowercase sto dash three lowercase g. Yes. I, as a human, I know exactly what you mean. Uh, are you also going to have a spec for common basis sets, common functionals? Yeah. Otherwise, that, otherwise we'll have like optimization. Yeah. Like that. So um, that's that's a really really lengthy topic that we should talk about. <laughs> um, uh, so only thing I can say is in terms of basis sets, um, Mulsey is actually taking over the MSL basis set exchange, and so we're going to do basis set hashes for all these things, and so we're going to have provide these mappings. Um, from you know an approximate representation like sto 3 g to an exact representation. So the so the community will need to buy into 
the standard that you guys are going to be yeah, setting. I see. If you, okay. if you have a better way of doing it, I, I'm, I'm not seeing it. <laughs> yeah. I'm not seeing it. Yeah. You, you said you're going to use hashes? So it's yeah. like in key for basis sets? <coughs> um, yeah, basically. Um, so you can kind of compress all the data into a single hash. Um, it's, it's good tech, and you get exact representations. OK. Yeah. Um, Does that mean we're going to have to learn to say hashes now? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> hashes are one heck of a good idea. Um, I'll explain more about that soon. Um, but yeah, so I, I'm going to move on a little bit, but I'm really happy to talk about this. This is something very close to me. Um, but it is a very complex topic. Um, and doing this right is going to be very hard. Um, so any kind of feedback that you have, I'd love to hear it. I mean, I guess you know, a lot of times something like this is a sort of a cosmically general approach which you, you know, just could take forever and be incredibly complicated. And then there's some really low hanging fruit for like, if you take care of like 80% of applications. So I would just mm -hmm. say, you know, if, if it gets too complicated, think about what your 80% is. Yep. And, that, you know. and that's actually in the, in the docs of you. Yeah, okay. that's, that's, cool. Cool. That, that, that's yes. a core philosophy. It's yeah. like, you know, we could argue this until the end of the day. But, exactly. You know, it's yeah. gotta push something out the door. Having a spec will be hugely valuable in just version of it, and, and that gives you the freedom to write the yeah. change. So, yeah, I just snipped it off, but this whole version, so <coughs> that's worked out. Um, again, love to hear comments on that. Uh, but. Uh, give give it give the GitHub repo a uh, read and um, please do chat with me. About this. So from my point of view, and I think many many people here, we're not doing QM calculations just to do QM calculations at least for this. And so although I appreciate that it's kind of nice, I could take a JSON help a file like this and load it into Python. Mm -hmm. What I really want for my workflow is being able to convert this directly to something like Mole two. Sure, I can. Load in the coordinate. I could do JSON dot load, get the coordinates, get the atom types, etc. But then I'm going to have to manually say, well, when I write my mole two, I want to put this in this column, and I want to put this in this column. Well, I think, I think that's where he was going earlier. Like, if we were then to represent what molecule it is, <coughs> then like the topology object we're going to be working on could read these directly. We can have a you know, open force the topology object. That it contains the same molecule as represented there, and then I can get right, down to or STFs or whatever you want. You use through OpenAI or IDE. Yeah, and the people working on this um, mm -hmm. represent things like OpenBabel and RDT and the like. So mm -hmm. you know, if the spec kicks off, it's going to put it directly into these, so that mm -hmm. you, know, you can also just run it through OpenBabel to put it to the same that you need as well. So basically, that's what you just said is the reason why we should make sure that they represent molecules the same way you can do it. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so everything is interesting. Yeah. Are, are these schemas going to be like hard schemas where all of these programs like RDKit are going to totally reject it if, it if it has additional fields that are non conformant with the spec? Yes, yeah, so that's what I was talking about the optional fields before. Okay. Um, so we have optional fields that you can do anything that you want in. I um, see, all right. And so like they're completely faster. Okay. Um, like which is. Mm -hmm. so, yes, exactly. Oh, right. So SD tags, SD is in yeah, the yeah, proper yeah. format, but the SD tags. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I completely agree because people are going to want to do kind of like off the wall things. And yes. So you you absolutely need optional. Yes. Yeah. That's you, the problem with mole two. Is that you it doesn't have optional. Yeah. And so basically, it means that because that problem with mole two, we have no good quality of function. Yeah. Um, and and this is why I like JSON because you can have arbitrary keys and you just add as many keys as you want, um, or XML or anything. Like well, and, and the problem with that, so I just this is something I learned at OpenAI is is today's flexibility is 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 a it's non-standard. Yeah. So we all we all agree we want to pass around our um, our fractional bond order by frac bo <laughs> and and you see what I mean? And then yeah. and, and then somebody else is saying so so today's optional fields are going to be general spec. And we absolutely know this, and if you have a way around it, I'd love to hear it. No, uh, I mean, uh, like uh, we, uh, we know we're going to no, hit these issues. Uh, I love SD yeah. tags because of the freedom that we need the freedom, but yeah. I'm just saying, we need, as a community, I think we, we've been saying, oh, isn't it wonderful to have flexibility? Mm -hmm. But whatever is flexible is non standard. Yeah. And, and where I think the, the bright future lies is that we come with the standard, which is what you know, we have the flexibility, but what we've got to understand is all this stuff, you know. My basement down in the, in the I am the, in those flexible <coughs> I think you should read through um, a version of the document. 
because the, the, it's basically saying that um, as we go through the versions, you know, if we implement this officially, you know, you're going to need to move up to comply. Um, and if you don't move up to comply, you lose your batch. Um, and I, if there's a better way to do it, I'd love to do it. But you know, I, I think you have to have flexibility at the same time um, because without that, we need flexibility. Yeah. yeah. Um, but then you have a way of pushing adoption on official level code. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> um, <okay. laughs> I will try to move on now, but we would love to talk to you about this more. Um, okay, so when it comes to, to databases, uh, what, what I find really interesting about um, quantum hamster databases is they're, they're so diverse. Like people are like, you know, I want energies and gradients and properties and and bond orders, and you know, I want to store some points. I want the electrostatic potentials, um, and and the, the data that I get is just completely diverse. Um, so it, it doesn't map super well to the conventional PostgreSQL uh, kind of databases. Um, so I kind of prefer the NoSQL databases like Dynamo and MongoDB. Um, this is a very hot topic as well. Um, most of the older database guys will um, curse this name and make fun of us forever. Um, at the same time, uh, I guess I'm making the canonical mistake and the canonical benefit of doing something that's flexible and easy for me now um, and realizing that's probably going to hurt me a little bit later. Um, the only other possibility in SQL that I found is actually Star SQL. Um, if anyone is an expert in Star SQL, please let me know. Um, I can't make it work very well. What, what is Star SQL specifically? Um, so basically, Star SQL is. It's kind of like an arbitrary nesting of even more tables. Um, and so you kind of like, you hash everything and you generate new tables on the fly based on what you need. Um, so it is kind of like taking like a MongoDB like data structure and then it kind of automatically figures out what goes in what tables. Hmm. Um, so it, it's kind of neat. Um, but like I said, I, I can't quite get the performance out of it that I can get from Mongo at the moment. Um, like I said, I, I, I'm not the world's foremost expert in databases, so if someone knows better, please let me know. Um, and the one thing I'll say is uh, hashing is one great, is one haunting great idea, and let's do more of that. Um, and so let me explain uh, why this is really cool, um, and especially why it's really good for Mongo. Mm -hmm. um, so the way that we, we kind of set up um, the current quantum chemistry database is, uh, first of all, we have these things called databases, which contain um, basically overarching collections. Um, so I might have like kind of like an ethyl alcohol collection, and you know, however I want to sort inside of it, um, I can do this. Um, and so you have kind of like a base molecule, so or a base reaction. So I might want to be like you know like ethyl alcohol, um, and then how do I store all these conformers that kind of relate to it? Um, and so we do this kind of through stoichiometry, um, where we have a very diverse set of stoichiometries with like labeled databases. Um, so for example, if I have thermochemistry uh, uh, database. Um, and I have stoichiometry, I have product and reactant, um, and I get the coefficients out front. Um, if I had like an interaction energy database, I'd have something like the dimer and then each of the monomers inside of it, and so the dimer would have a coefficient of one and the monomers of minus one. Um, so I can get arbitrary linear combinations of these molecules back out. Um, and as a note, the, whenever I have these stoichiometries, um, they're always going to be a coefficient to a molecule hash, actually. Because um, if I think about these things, I'm going to have lots and lots of duplicates, um, especially like interaction energies and reaction databases. I, I have the same molecule that needs to appear in multiple places. Um, so we simply hash the whole molecule. Um, we can just link to it this way. Um, so we take molecules. Like I said, we have full molecule spec. It um, has a lot more data points uh, than what you see here. How do you, how do you generate that hash? I mean, just look. Um, like I said, you're in JSON, so you're already in a standardized representation. So you can, you're in JSON, so you're already in a standardized representation. So you can just call like any given hash load, and it's just going to hash the bits. I guess maybe I'm maybe this would be a question, but basically you have like a smile of energy of a molecule, and you want to turn it into a hash, right? Yeah. So and you want that to be unique for that molecule, so you can find it. Well, so energy isn't fully unique, right? I mean, and so that, these are the questions I'm asking. There are smiles in a sense, right? So I the question. So that's the question. I mean, are you you're going to have to deal with are you going to have to deal with these underlying 
smiles and cute type issues to generate UV caches. Well, I said, you know, I this is for quantum chemistry. This is this is not any kind of like this. I'm just trying to give you some ideas yeah. of what we do in quantum. Yours chemistry. even has the geometry in it, right? Yeah. So like for us, like our molecules are fully stacked. So like they are, you know, I have this geometry, you know, these atoms, these masses, these charges. You know, that That's totally unique. Then yeah, it's completely unique. Oh, the ge but the geometry, you, you you're not going to do. S the geometries will never be exactly the same, right? So you can't have. Well, I mean, what you can do is you can, one, you can align them to a principal axis, you can center and mass them, and then you can round to like 12 decimal places. Um, and you convert this to a serial representation, and you can actually get exact matches. I said, in quantum <coughs> chemistry, this has been proven to be good enough for us. Okay, yeah. So I'm not trying to be critical, I'm just trying to understand. I, I guess it, it sort of goes again to the question of what is the molecule in the final, right? You know, is there a smile string? Is, is it, so this is a different. Concept of mm -hmm. and, and like I said from the beginning, I'm not yeah. sure these ideas map to you guys. I'm just trying to give you some ideas yeah. to think about a little bit. There's there's a little problem with the rotational variance that that if you use a DFT grid that's <clears throat> not fine enough, you can get errors on the, in like the third or fourth decimal place when you just have an overall rotation of your molecule. Sure. Yeah. So I mean, <clears throat> the thing about this though is we prevent the QM programs from doing any kind of rotations on us. So whatever we give them, we put like no com, no reorient. So whatever we give them, it keeps with. Um, and that has proven to get around the rotational invariance of DFT, for example. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, this, uh, this stuff is massively fun and more complex than you really want. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, and then finally, what we have is we have uh, what we call pages. And these pages are going to be the actual results of these key computations. So I have a molecule hash and a whole bunch of results. And so what happens is, um, and if you think about this really carefully, this can be done completely with extremely fast join operations, like using tables. Um, you start with a reaction, and you say, uh, or an entire database, and you say, I want you know all the results for this stoichiometry and this method. Um, go off and get those for me. So what it's going to do is it's going to go in, it's going to hit the stoichiometry, it's going to figure out all the hashes that I need. Um, it's then going to query my pages, get all that QM information, put it back in a giant table. Uh, if I need to do any collapsing or summing based off these coefficients, it does that. And what I get back out is um, your complete result. Uh, and so this kind of approach has the really nice ability that, um, one, I'm not duplicating molecule information all over the place and a couple other information. Um, two, uh, this is going to be unique between my molecule and my input information. So I can have uh, arbitrary methods attached to these molecules and pages. Um, so if I want b 3 web ADZ, I can pull that up. If I want um, you know, PPE, ADZ, I can do that too. Um, so. Uh, so this is what we've, we've come up with. Um, it works, uh, I think, extremely well for actually quantum chemistry data. Um, I think you, know, you guys should think about you know, exactly how you want these uh, how you want to do these kinds of things. Um, but I just want to kind of give you some ideas, again, like I was saying before. Um, yeah. <clears throat> Sorry, it's, you have something to show. But is it, you're going to, I mean, you're going to be able to find all these instances of ethanol in your database service? That's the thing, is like you, if you okay. want to find ethanol, for yeah. example, like you, that's going to have to be like some sort of key that you have to give it. A key? Yeah. I mean, so you can always go diving through all of the, all the geometries and molecules at a later point. But that's yeah. um, so like you can actually do that with um, single Mongo queries, especially if you have the bond information. Um, you know, so for example, like I think for you guys, what you do is like in your molecule, you put kind of like the, the isometric smile string in, um, and then what you can do is you can just ask Mongo and say, "Give me all molecule hashes that match this isometric smile string," and so it's just going to do that and pull back all your hashes, and then you can query your databases. How will it know? How will Mongo know which hashes match? Well, because I mean, no, well, okay. So when I say the hash, this is just the key for it. The what? The key. Like so, this is like you know, um, like the main index for these things. So I can get it extremely fast. They're key yeah. value databases mostly, yeah. right? So yeah. you you say I want the value that's stored in like it's like a dictionary or app. No, I get that, but I guess what, what I'm, and again I may be misunderstanding this entirely. But if the, mo if the molecule is defined, if the molecule is defined in geometry in mm -hmm. a specific yeah. way, that yeah. ethanol is going to have a whole lot of different hashes. Oh yeah, 
So yeah. that, I was just wondering, how do you find all the instances of ethanol? Awesome. Saying is like so yeah. two ways. So the first thing is you can add your small isometric smile strength to this molecule, right? And so then, oh, yeah, like exactly. I can look up, I can do queries on any piece of data in here. Um, or alternatively, I could just pull up every single molecule, look at its geometry, and say, is this ethanol or not? Um, that, so that's a non-trivial. <clears> so let me just so I I. I have very much this, so I just want to phrase, paraphrase. So here's what I think we need is this community here is going to very, very frequently want to identify entries in your database by molecular topology. So it would probably be extremely helpful to just, as a nightly update or something, is to pre-calculate the, the um, going from the <clears throat> say isomeric smiles or some other topology yeah. and the key backwards to that. And that's what I'm saying is absolutely so like whenever you insert a new molecule, like what you should just go ahead and do is compute this. Right? So that it becomes part of your molecule specification. Right? So Yeah, but I guess what I'm I think maybe part of what they're getting at that I'm not understanding yet. Everything is under is bit you know, everything is sort of stored as like key value pairs where the key is the hash for the molecule. Uh, How do I like right. access which keys are going to contain the molecule yeah. I want without unpacking all of them. Right. So and, and so this is where Mongo actually really excels, right? So if I had you know smile string equals this, <clears throat> what I can go into and I say is in one line of code I can say Mongo give me every single um, molecule the whole thing that has this smile string associated with it. And it's, um, it's fast, time. but. Decoding the hash in some way, or is it just looking no, no, at the different okay. places? So, in the file? so the, the hash is just an index. I know. Yeah. So it, it has so all the information. So the okay, okay. So it's sort of like a pandas <laughs> data frame in a way, but where the, yeah. the hash is the index, but it also has all the other fields. Yeah. yeah. So what, so Mongo is hard because it's actually an n-dimensional hashed index object. Um, so what that means is that any key that I really care about, I can go ahead and make a hash index of it. And Mongo will just automatically do this for me. Okay. So if I want to query like smiles, I'm just like, hey, okay. I'm going to query smiles a lot, and it's going to hash an index. Okay. Rate. So, the, so the answer is that the, the database will already have in it, in addition to the hash, it will already have whatever key. Wait. So what's the hash getting you then? So the hash is more like identifiers. I know it's identifier, but if it's so very, very microscopically specific about the geometry, it's but, okay. But it's just one possible identifier. It's uh -huh. a very useful one for a lot. So what you do is you create a new index based off the smile stream, mm -hmm. and, and so Mongo just handles that. You know, oh, I say like, okay. yeah, okay. it's like okay. you know, so I think this is important. on this to find your molecules. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So that Mongo is kind of neat because it's you can do any query lookup to any key value pair in the entire thing that you want. Um, and if you know that you're going to use one a lot, you can make it extremely fast because it's going to go ahead and pretty hash that index for you. Yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah. so is there going to be a, a separation of information supplied by the user when setting up the calcula calculation, which I imagine could be like the geometry and the atom, and all sorts of alternatively useful um, generated information? Like, say, eventually you want to create a database on some particular smart strings. Yeah. So you want to get all the molecules that contain whatever. Obviously, when you specify the molecule for the calculation, you don't want to necessarily have to do that. But are there going to be, you know, cron jobs that are calculating the smile strings and the smart strings and whatever else and could be useful? Yeah, so your server can do basically you know, anything that you want okay. um, in terms of that. So if you if you have a common index that you're going to look up a lot, you just tell Mongo, like, this is my common index. Go ahead okay. and keep building it you know, as soon as it comes in. Got it. Um, and, and realistically, kind of my hope is that if you do something like this, 90% of you will never actually see this. You'll just see the front end. I'm just trying to give some, I was asked to do databases, so I was talking a little bit about what the back end could look like. But it, it's always easy to go back and add more data fields to these later, right? right? Yeah. And, and yeah, that, that gets tricky, and I, I see Chris <laughs> looking at me. Um, but yeah. I, I think so. so to, the way I think of using this in LF app, because I think it's a really good idea, and now that I'm relieved that we can go from smiles to hash, then we will go get that, you know, we can get that smiles table, the tail of isomeric smiles. We can do our substructure searches with anybody's substructure search, 
commodity level of infrastructure mm -hmm. and software we want and come back with these are the molecules we want. Then we go back into the database. So we're not I don't think we need to ask Daniel, your your work here to actually do substructure searches. Yes. Right. Yeah, and, and this is like so if you actually need to pull out every single molecule, like this is something that your server can do. Um, you know, like pull out every molecule, examine it, do something to it. Pull out the smiles. So so how we're gonna get from our world yeah. into your database yeah. is what we're gonna say probably or the way I'm imagining doing it is isomeric smiles based. We have to know what's in your database, but that's just a bunch of smile strings, a gazillion but, smile strings. Yeah, you, actually. you can pull out the unique smiles. Find your substructure or the smiles that match your substructures, and then pull oh, all the uh, hashes. The hashes that exactly. match those. Yes, yeah. and, that, and that's going to work. Yeah. Yeah, and, and it's not going to be slow. It's, all the Smurf stuff is is outside your world. Our our lingo of Franca is just yeah. the isomeric mm -hmm. smile strings. And so this is why I really like these servers, because basically what you do is you say like, you know, hey, what I really want is I want this kind of data that's sliced this way, you know, that has these restraints on it. Um, and so what the, the server admin does is they go ahead and implement this little REST function. And then so whenever uh, you want to call it from anything, you say, like, here's my REST call, you know, go ahead and grab this data for me. Um, and so like a lot of this, you know, the, I think the point of Mongo in a lot of ways is you can, you can index this thing any way you want. Um, and so it's just a matter of like actually sitting down and being like, okay, you know, if I want to do a, a Smirks lookup in this particular fashion, well, here's like a little bit of code that does that. You know, hook that into your REST API and not let anyone call it. It would be, I mean, maybe once the infrastructure's in place, it would be bad to put sort of a molecule aware interface on it so you could draw things and you know, do paper like that, yeah. which is supposed to have so, to do your own search. It. You know, pull it and do the mm -hmm. searches and then send Yeah, yeah I agree. I understand so what you're saying, but, but that means most of the interface or the database means. Give me the whole database, and then I'll do no, the well, search. Like well, so I, I really think you guys should look through the video that I posted okay. in general, like because for all, for the user interface, like that's kind of what that video kind of entails, like you know how I want to like look at molecules, how I want to slice them, how I want to compute them, um, and and that's where I get, I get those ideas out. Like this is this is like purely like kind of like a back end thing okay. in terms of like really hardcore databases. So I'm, I'm kind okay. of going. All right, I'm, I'm over. Should I stop soon? Mm -hmm. We try to see towards finishing, but we need to see the rest. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, we did servers, uh, your intermediate cloud um, of databases. Oh, I'm sorry, we're servers now. Um, so we've kind of done uh, these two pieces in addition to the schema. Um, so one of the big things about this is uh, I think you guys are going to have a lot of different uh, compute requirements. Um, so you, you, you're going to want to basically run on everything, anywhere you can get some time. And there's a lot of things out there. So, um, you know, for example, the Open Science Grid, a lot of people don't hit that very much, but it's certainly a really great place to get some compute time um, for high throughput jobs. Um, the possibility of doing Buoyant, your local clusters, your supercomputers, and AWS if you want. So you, you kind of have, in a lot of ways, almost, um, you have too much compute that's too diverse. Um, so kind of what I, I would recommend doing is you do container setups. Um, either based on Docker, Kubernetes, um, or Singularity, depending if you're on some sort of supercomputer. You can also do more uh, permanent setups, like through something like Conda. Um, and then, so what you can do is you can actually marshal all this through uh, cloud-based queuing tech. And so, a good example is Fireworks from Materials uh, Project. And so, what this does is basically, as a client, I say I want to compute all of these things in this way. That's going to go up to your cloud, and it's going to sit there. And what's going to happen <coughs> is some user somewhere, like say on AWS or anywhere, is going to be like, hey, I have some compute time, you know, give me some jobs. And so your intermediate server is going to dispatch jobs. And so you, know, you might have some sort of requirements, like, you know, I'm on a small computer, or like I submitted these jobs, I want to prioritize them, or the like. Um, and so you have this gigantic, um, this gigantic queue, you can pull down compute from anywhere. Um, and then whenever these things are done, they will automatically send it back to the main server and then into your database. Um, and so what this kind of does is it, it kind of gets around, um, again, like one person having to um, submit a whole bunch of jobs on their supercomputer super um, and then collect, or collecting the data and then pushing it back to the server manual. Um, there's tech out there that can get around all of this where you can push it to your server, it computes it, and it pushes back to your database uh, basically transparently. Um, so clients, uh, so clients is where uh, you guys are really going to come into play uh, in terms of like front end user content. 
Um, so they're going to basically pull slices uh, from the cloud, and I highly suggest that you cache all this liberally so you're not pulling this forever. Um, if you want to use like uh, REST or SOAP APIs, um, depending on how fancy you want to get, is always a good thing because you get language agnostic data. Um, so for example, um, the visualizer is really going to want JavaScript or the like. Um, so JSON is the JavaScript object notation, uh, so it kind of matches perfectly to them. And REST is very, very common across the language barriers. Um, and so clients can do anything and everything from submitting new computations to fitting things to building FF images and statistics and the like. So whatever you guys need, this is what your client's going to do. Um, so effectively, the goal of these things is to take over the world. Um, I don't, I don't know the full suite, but you know, kind of giving an idea of like how these guys will interact is they can query the database in arbitrary ways and cache that data. Um, and so with that, that kind of ends um, my, my database, uh, just kind of giving an overview of some things out there and some things to think about. Um, I also wanted to talk about a couple of good things to do real quick. Um, and so the first thing is uh, uh, use formatters. So I look in code and uh, you know, sometimes there are different spaces, different places, and not everything's like aligned. Um, whenever you do something like this, you increase the cognitive overhead of someone trying to understand it uh, quite dramatically. Um, there's something called YAP out there from Google, which is another Python formatter. Um, you just run it across all of your code, and you completely forget about having to bother to format or anything like that. You just, no matter what kind of garbage you do, as long as it's bottled Python, it's going to format it into a very consistent way across everything. Um, highly, highly recommend this kind of tech. Um, also, code coverage. Um, I see a lot of these projects, they have um, CI, which is really great. Um, but the question is always, you have unit tests and regression tests, but how much do you actually cover? Um, so I think in one extreme example, um, someone told me that they did a really, really great job of code coverage, and um, I ran CodeCub on it, and they had about 10% of their total code base. Um, so unless you actually run it, it's really hard to know how much you're actually covering. Um, and the more you cover, uh, basically the better you do, especially with regard to people doing arbitrary pull requests and kind of modifying uh, core parts of the code. Um, so extremely useful. Um, also, uh, I, I see I made up a new um, text-based input file. Um, so based off of uh, dollar signs, because I thought that was pretty cool. Um, so uh, whenever you do this kind of thing, you have to say like um, you know, widths and you know, try to parse the lines one by one. Um, so I would highly suggest uh, kind of trying to stay away from this kind of thing. Um, so you know, this is the same thing in JSON, and you probably say like from a human side, JSON's a little bit hard to do. People are not actually going to do this. Um, fortunately, people know this, and so instead what they did was they came up with something called YAML. Um, I think YAML uh, is not any more complex to read and use than any kind of these ASCII-based input files. Um, and the big thing is, in most languages, I can say import YAML and YAML.load this. And I get this whole key value pair coming back. Um, I think it's a really good idea to avoid all this custom ASCII parsing, um, especially for things like inputs. Uh, also, um, when it comes to communities, uh, these things are very hard to do. Um, I take all of my advice from Greg Wilson, who built Software Carpentry. Um, he's always really recommended uh, actually reading this book. Um, he likes it because he calls it slightly flawed, um, so it actually generates a lot of uh, discussion if you guys actually read through the book chapter by chapter and discuss it within a group. Um, I think his best quote was, uh, if he had actually done this before he started Software Carpentry, he'd be five years ahead of where it is now because he learned all these lessons the hard way. Um, so definitely worth some time looking through. I think. Um, and then the last thing I'm going to say is uh, I really check out other big open source projects. Um, so I think Phoenix is a really good one. It's another academic uh, industrial collaboration. Um, they have things like their steering committees. They have CLAs. Um, they set up a lot of things right. Um, so I really recommend going to projects like this. Um, if you want to find all of them, you can go underneath the NumFocus banner, and I think most of the NumFocus-based projects uh, have done a really good job of like kind of working through these issues. Um, so definitely worth uh, reading through these things. And my absolute last comment um, is uh, people say like software is freeze and freedom. Um, and I don't feel like people really get that that well anymore. Um, so my comment is uh, software is as free as a puppy. Because um, who, who wants one of these guys? Yeah. Um, but then once you have them, you're like, oh, you got to feed them, and then there's vet bills, and uh, they're probably going to pee on your carpet, and 
eat one of your pizzas and then throw up that pizza on your carpet again. <laughs> um, so uh, when this happens, uh, you know, what you have to do is you have to guide them through these processes. There's always going to be these growing pains, um, and throughout their lifetime, they're going to require a lot of maintenance and attention. Um, so this is true for every single software out there. Software is not free. I mean, I know it's open source, but you know, think about all the time that you put into it, all the resources that you do. Um, so uh, software, it does need good attention to be really good software. If you neglect it, it will be a bad dog. Um, so really focus on your software and give it the attention that it needs. Um, and with that, I think I'm done. And thank you for your time. Other questions or comments on that? So um, now we need to sort of start heading towards subgroups, um, like a couple like school items. I'm going to do, let me turn off the 